We're a bit of a hybrid between conventional agriculture, small farms, family farms, and educational establishment. We have a little of both. We do raise somewhere on the order of four to five thousand fruit trees, and we raise sweet corn and pumpkins and various row crops, strawberries and raspberries and so forth. But we don't really, nor would we ever think that we could actually provide a living for the number of people that we actually do selling produce. So we have the challenges of you know dealing with Mother Nature and, and bringing in a crop. If we were just to sell the produce alone, we'd have a very difficult time uh, making a living. In a farm this size, where what we work is about 55 acres, it's quite difficult because it's a very large area to maintain, but there's not very much money in the produce itself. We actually have customers come and pay us so that they can go pick. So during the fall, for a few months, we'll make very large amounts of money for a few days um, of a week for maybe two to three months. Then the rest of the year, we're very, very slow. And then in the summertime, we can produce large amounts of produce, fresh watermelon, strawberries, zucchini, but those are also very hard to sell for any type of profits. A lot of what we do is seasonal, and we're, right now we're getting ready to go into our apple season. And we're getting all the things ready for that. We have to know what the price of the apples are, what the different apples are that are coming ripe. I think right now we've got the, the Ozark, the Lodi, the Royal Gala. There's all these different kinds of uh, apples I've never heard of until I started working here. So, But just getting everything ready for the start of apple season where we'll start having thousands, literally thousands of people here on a fall Saturday. Being prepared for that, having people to marshal traffic, get the cars parked, make sure people go to the right orchard and they're not picking green apples and they're not falling in a pond somewhere. So there's a lot that goes into that. It's just, it's a constant, uh, co not battle, but it's just constant uh, learning for all of the uh, customers we have here to come in and find out how to really pick an apple. You don't just pull, you lift and twist. Even up until the last five minutes before a tour, you can have things completely change. You're handed your uh, rotation sheet, which tells you what's uh, going to happen, but that's not necessarily <laughs> What's going to happen? So much happens and there's so many things that happen just in life that you just you, you really notice here. There was one morning, as a matter of fact, when it was, it was slightly rainy, slightly more overcast, and we had a certain number of schools because they thought there might be snow cancel. They called us and said that they were canceling. So we were sure that these schools had canceled. And so uh, Susan ran into the office and rewrote the, the rotation sheets completely uh, so that it was a smaller rotation and everything was going differently. Well, the secretary had been misinformed and <laughs> they had not actually canceled. And this was one entire school, perhaps uh, 120 children were coming from this school and they had not canceled and they suddenly showed up in their buses so about five to fifteen minutes somewhere in there uh, we had a lot of mad hustling to write them back into the schedule I had been told one original location for my station I had gone and changed it to another location I went to the third location and during the middle of the tour it began to rain and so suddenly I had my group of children for that one uh, village post for about 15 minutes of a presentation standing back to back with another lady who had her group back to back with mine. We're both gesticulating and telling our different stations, our different lessons at the same time, trying to be loud enough for our children above the rain, but not to drown out the other. And so it, uh, it led for quite a, a bit of a battle of... Uh, of the stations. So one of the challenges of being a uh, living history farm is though we are an actual apple farm and do produce and sell apples, we don't make enough on that alone to survive necessarily. So we do our living history presentations and various activities. One of my personal favorites is dances and balls and such that we do. Uh, such as coming up now in September, we have our Blue Gray Ball to take place in about 1860 and we, it's one of our costume events, costume required events, where everyone, guests and staff included, are dressed up in the 1880s or 1860s time period. We have our berry pickers ball, we have our night before Mother's Day and night before Father's Day dinner and dance, we have, let's see, our Legend of Sleepy Hollow dinner and dance, we have 
uh, Christmas Carol and various other ones. As I said, my personal favorite on that is when we actually do the dances. Each of our dinners include uh, a large uh, meal with several different courses included on that depending on the exact style of dinner that it is. And we'll have various activities, but one that's almost guaranteed is the dancing. And I'm one of the, the dance masters here at the farm, so I have the, the pleasure of teaching and leading a lot of the different dances. We do Virginia Reel, the Ball of Yarn, Patty Cake Polka, uh, Yankee Doodle, the Black Nag, and countless other ones that we'll uh, be teaching through the different dinners and such, and it's a whole lot of fun. What I've got here are a couple of tomahawks. These are uh, a, a good example of one of the activities, the many activities that we offer up here at Riley's Farm. Uh, the public can come up here, walk onto the farm, and experience all kinds of fun activities like the tomahawk throw. We'll teach them just how to take a tomahawk and be able to sink it into the target. And with, our, with tomahawk, we also uh, offer archery, and a person can come up here and learn how to shoot an arrow. Uh, we also do the farm walk, which is a brief, uh, about a 15 or 20 minute walk about the farm. And we talk about some of the plants and some of the historical things about the farm. Um, we also do uh, quill and ink, where people can learn how to write with uh, the, the quill pen dipped in an ink urn. And we also offer weaving, yes. And then of course you can come up and you can press your own gallon of cider. And uh, that's a whole separate activity that we offer also during the summer. We also have our School of the Revolution program. It's a play that we offer. It's an interactive drama. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it's uh, a play featuring John Adams, Patrick Henry, and Benjamin Franklin, and of course Abigail Adams, John's wife. And uh, it's uh, basically, it's explaining the, the events that lead up to the, the Declaration of Independence, some of the emotions that these people went through. You get to see that they were people doing what they thought was right. And um, so that's our summer play. That's going to continue to be offered during the fall when they're booked. And that's brand new this, this season. Uh, I, of course, play the, the villainous tavern keeper. That's me. Um, and then during the regular season, uh, summer's our slow time, of course. We offer in the fall, uh, you pick uh, apples and pears. We have blackberries, which are already started in the summertime, raspberries and the like. And we also do, of course, year-round sell our, our famous five-pound apple pie. Um, either the double crust or the crumb crust, big favorite. We also do, in the springtime, we offer our Revolutionary War Tour, and of course that's throughout the year, but primarily the bulk of it's in the spring. And our Colonial Farm Life is offered throughout the year. That's a, a two-hour version of the Revolutionary War without the conflict, without the, the red coats, the muskets, and all of that. Um, the stations people get to experience are life in the colonies. They get to experience uh, what it would be like to, to muster up into a militia and to march as a soldier, either for the Patriots or for the British. And this is primarily for fifth graders, that is, for the Rev Tour. And they also get to experience um, candle dipping on the overnight program, of course. They also get to experience the blacksmith, how blacksmiths would operate, the Just quartering like that, that. acts, uh, no. that's the quartering of troops in American homes, and the sentiments that that would stir up. They also get to experience the Admiralty Court, some of the injustices that were done uh, under legal jurisdiction by the British to the colonists. Um, and the Stamp Act, of course, one of the many acts that uh, the colonists rebelled against and particularly was never enforced. Uh, so that would be the, the, the bulk of what we offer and uh, it's, it's a great place to be, a lot of fun. What we found up here in Oak Glen was that there are a lot of folks who buy two or three acres of land and they think they've bought the rights to three or four thousand acres of solitude. So somebody opens up a camp for kids next to them and, and uh, their impulse is to try and shut them down. And, and I've always thought, you know, if you love a field next to you, if you love that beautiful field full of wildflowers next to you and you've bought your home and you want to enjoy that field of wildflowers but it doesn't happen to be yours, maybe you ought to buy that field of wildflowers uh, so that you can preserve it. But don't tell the fellow who, or who owns that field of wildflowers that they've got to come, somehow keep it for your personal enjoyment. And, and we run into that. We ran a lot into, into our struggle in, in establishing a living history farm for families because when, when you open up a farm like this to the public, you create an attraction. You know, there might be as many as 10 or 12 buses full of school kids that come up here in a day. And if you talk about an environmentally sensitive way of bringing people to Oak Glen, a school bus is about as good as they get. I mean, you put everybody in one vehicle, you drive them up the hill, you don't create a, a Disneyland monstrosity of a whole parking lot full of cars. Um, and so we felt it was a pretty environmentally sensitive and a culturally sensitive thing to do because we were educating kids, we're paying for the farm, and we thought it was win-win, but there are 
small cadre of people who, competing business people and, and neighbors who really don't like people, truth be told, and didn't want anybody next to them. Uh, American battle history really, really doesn't take place in municipal parks with neat manicured lawns and, and little uh, blacktop uh, trails. It really occurred on farms. And so uh, we were approached years ago by um, some Civil War reenactors to um, re do battle reenactments. And it was a perfect environment to reenact things like Gettysburg and, and the Revolutionary era, era, Saratoga and Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill. Because that's all farm country. And so um, when um, you wonder what it's like to run a small farm, we really don't run uh, a small farm. We do raise crops and we use them uh, as loss leaders uh, to, uh, to educate people about, about farming and, and, and about American history. So um, we're a very unconventional small farm as uh, small farms go. Um, we basically uh, are a uh, trial and error farm in, in some ways. We try lots of different things. We do living history dinners where um, we'll bring up uh, Civil War actors and everybody is dressed in uh, antebellum clothing and we have uh, Civil War brass bands and our guests pay to be part of a, of a dinner in the past. So that's a very one of our uh, more popular programs. We have uh, uh, Sleepy Hollow, which is um, uh, a celebration of Washington and Irving's um, uh, timeless uh, tale of romance and hijinks. And, uh, well, we find that our customers like being in um, open spaces where there's neatly laid out orchards and pumpkin fields and uh, very few fences. And, um, and they're willing um, to pay for those spaces by, you know, buying dinner from us or buying uh, Americana. I mean, quill and ink sets and paper and you know looms and that sort of thing and period clothing and um, and but mostly uh, I think what our mainstay has been is uh, uh, reenacting the Revolutionary War for uh, school children and um, out here in California there's uh, not very much Revolutionary War living history uh, um, uh, even in the reenacting community there's not very many reenactors who um, who take that as their hobby, as their era, and um, and so we found that uh, there was a, an open market for. Um, uh, so, but fortunately, I think that the powers that be saw the wisdom of our project, and we won unanimously. And um, and now we face the challenge of uh, going on with this original vision that we um, uh, we all fell in love with as a family 20 years ago. And it's it's a no one has written the the book really the textbook on how to run a living history farm or how to run a living history venue. My personal feeling is that if you look around the country and you see places that preserve American history, they tend to be run by docents, um, by uh, nonprofit museums. And a lot of them are great, uh, but uh, a lot of docents and a lot of nonprofits don't have the impulse to please the customer the way a for-profit uh, business does. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that we're a small family business, we're for-profit. Um, and that means that all of our staff is trained to uh, love and respect the guests, to, to appreciate them as, um, you know, members of their family. So, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I get a little emotional because we fought pretty hard for the farm.